The straits, inlets and shores of British Columbia are precious. Each day they provide us with food, livelihood, recreation and inspiration. Hopefully these shorelines will be tomorrow's treasures as well. That is up to us. This is an oil tanker. Ships like this navigate these waters daily, visiting ports in Canada and the United States. The shores of Vancouver Island, the Gulf Islands, and the east reaches of the Strait of Georgia are exposed to the bulk of this traffic, which includes thousands of other large ships. Countless fuel barges and cargo vessels also do business here. Some are not properly crewed or maintained. All are laden with some kind of petroleum product. And as long as we're engaged in the transportation of major volumes of, of oil products and crude oil, uh, we have to be prepared for the risk that one of those transportation functions is going to break down at some time. These are circumstances that can pose a deadly threat to the ocean and all it touches if an oil cargo suddenly becomes an oil spill. The fact is you can't clean up an oil spill. You can't get the genie back in the bottle. You can get 2% of the genie or 5% of the genie or if you're really lucky, maybe a little more. But basically, you can't clean it up. Can science and technology find better ways to put the genie back? Can improved cooperation and understanding be the ultimate safeguard? How are we, our government and industry, supporting each of these paths? How do we deal with the threat of blackened waters? Like the rhythms of the ocean itself, questions about the threat of oil spills cycle in and out of our collective concerns. Perhaps this is because major spills are relatively rare, and when they're out of sight, they're usually out of mind. This was not the case on New Year's Day, 1989. Carried by the wintry Pacific, oil began washing up on the west coast of Vancouver Island. A fuel barge, the Nestuka, had collided with a tug off the northwest tip of the United States, releasing over 800 tons of bunker fuel. Weather and currents carried the fuel northward toward Barkley Sound, Long Beach, and Tofino. Members of the Euclid band were some of the first on the scene. Fisherman Harold but, Tucci was one know, of them. I mean, people kept assuring us that everything was going to be fine. When the oil spill happened in the States, we did not find out about it till it was just a few hundred yards off our shores. We didn't see any response at all from the polluters, so we as a community banded together and decided that if they weren't going to clean it, we were going to clean it. Later that year, Alaska had similar problems, but on a much larger scale. The Exxon Valdez rupture and unleashed a massive slick affecting more than a thousand miles of coastline in Prince William Sound. One of the largest and most frustrating cleanups in history followed. Crews from all over North America used almost every type of cleanup method science and industry offered. Some hard lessons were learned here. This was one of them. Expensive high-pressure cleaning made affected beaches look much better at the time but there was a high price for such cosmetics. Over the long term, the scalding water drove oil deeper into the sediment and killed small organisms essential to the food chain. This made recovery far slower than if nothing were done at all. 1989 was to be a pivotal year, a reality check. Suddenly, we knew firsthand what happens when oil meets water, our water. We weren't prepared, and, and all the public statements that came from them, the politicians and the authorities at the time saying, we're doing a good job, we're prepared, everything's fine, they weren't true. 
It just simply were not true. Until the spills of 89, Bob Bosson spent most of his time as a professional musician. Then the events of the Nestuka spill transformed him into an activist. I mean, who wants Bob Bosson, a banjo player for God's sake, you know, telling us what to do when we know the business and we're looking out for it? Bob took the bureaucracy head on and started the organization Call for Inquiry, which began questioning the basic decision-making process involved in oil spill prevention and response. There's a certain amount of constant vigilance that's necessary because any system will weaken over 10, 20 years. And if there's not another spill like that, and the reports get shelved, and there's gradually cutbacks, and there's no really strong citizens' oversight, one really has to worry. You know, because because people don't uh, people aren't practiced, aren't expert at cleaning up oil spills if there haven't been any oil spills to clean up. Vancouver Harbor. This is a vessel from Burrard Clean, a private company funded by the oil industry to head the mechanical cleanup of spills. Since 1976, Burrard Clean and its director, Martin Green, have dealt with spills of all sizes, including the Valdez. Hundreds of incidents later, Green hasn't forgotten the mixed blessing of the Nestuka. I think what it did do for us here in Canada, particularly in BC, was to make a much more greater awareness of working together and I suppose exposed our shortcomings very quickly and very easily in terms of response. And I think both federal, provincial and industry and the public at large learned an awful lot from that incident. One important lesson was this. The industry, the public and the government agencies involved in spill response had to know more about what each other was doing. From that need came this group, British Columbia's Marine Spills Coordinating Committee. It's a unique organization based on the cooperation of industry and several government agencies. From this foundation, now the province also takes part in an international task force coordinating response efforts and strategy for the west coast of Canada and the United States. The province of British Columbia recognizes that it doesn't deal alone when it's dealing with the spill of oil to its shores. We work with Canadian Coast Guard, with Environment Canada, with the state of Washington, and within the province with the Provincial Emergency Program to make sure that we're prepared. I think it's what has given to us is a common forum where all the various agencies involved can meet, can share their problems, hopefully solve a few, and with industry, and we've tried to play a, a strong part in there, be pre better prepared for any future incident that might occur. When a crisis comes, how will this new cooperation pay off? How will it help those, human and non-human, directly affected by the harsh reality of a spill? Are you planning on coming to our meeting on the 27th? For years, uh -huh. Dee Walmsey has been tirelessly networking, trying to consolidate the efforts of local environmental groups into an effective citizen response unit a trained volunteer force to protect the beauty and the bird life of Boundary Bay, just south of Vancouver. From here, the United States border isn't far away, along with this receiving station at Cherry Point. Here, a constant flow of tankers siphon their massive loads into a nearby refinery. Any spill of consequence here would threaten the beaches and estuaries of Boundary Bay and others nearby. Despite all her efforts, Dee Walmsey is still worried. Because the Valdez is so far away now, so remote, the Shetlands was so remote, um, oil spills have become blasé on television now. Whereas at one time, you really got a gut-wrenching feeling when you saw these birds. Now it's like everything else. So the emotionalism has gone out of it, and that funding has gone out because of the same reason. Then how will we deal with the spill? How can we make safe seas and tight budgets compatible? I feel that the, the cooperative aspect is absolutely key to response activity. And on the practical side of things, one of the things that's achieved is ensuring that we're not duplicating each other's effort unnecessarily. With an objective to, uh, Increased communication and efficiency is coming from cooperative efforts like the Marine Spills Coordinating Committee. 
Also, each of the agencies involved bring an array of talent and new technology to the table. If a spill occurs, the Federal Department of Fisheries and Oceans is set to deliver the latest information on currents and sea conditions. For example, this Coast Guard helicopter has just dropped a special transmitter into the sea. Developed by DFO, this device will float on the edge of an oil slick and send data to lead agencies via satellite. While the Coast Guard monitors the situation from an airborne tracking station, DFO can integrate this information into computer simulation models, which can better predict the course of a spill. Cooperating with the Canadian or U.S. Coast Guard and port authorities, industry-sponsored cleanup agencies such as Berard Clean and Clean Sound are set to go into action. Their large fleet of vessels, stationed in strategic locations, are ready to round up as much oil as possible before it hits the beaches. Additional spill equipment is warehoused at various Coast Guard and industry facilities along the coast, all of it ready to go into action at a moment's notice. If oil threatens the shoreline, the BC Ministry of Environment stands by with one of the latest evolutions in computer technology. The OSRA system, a multimedia environmental database, gives spill managers and shoreline crews fast information on wildlife, recreational, and culturally sensitive areas. This is compiled with further data from DFO, the Canadian Wildlife Service, and Environment Canada. This is an Environment Canada response team, gathering information on wildlife and resources along the Canadian coastline. When spills occur, these experts are called upon to assess threatened areas so that the most effective strategies are directed where they're most needed. Environment Canada can also provide scientific and technical advice to the cleanup effort. If the source of the spill is unknown, scientists at Environment Canada's Vancouver labs can actually examine the molecular fingerprint of an oil slick, tracing it back to the ship or facility that released it. Recently, the Canadian Coast Guard and Environment Canada have been experimenting with in situ burning, igniting the oil before it reaches the shore. They've been rigorously testing this spectacular method, evaluating not only its efficiency, but the potential consequences it may have on the land, the sea, and the air. On the whole, in situ burning is getting high marks and will probably be used in the near future depending on the size and type of spill. As is the case with other methods, it is highly dependent on favorable seas. At this time, booms and skimmers remain the mechanical method of choice if conditions aren't too choppy and the oil has not reached the shore. If that happens, scraping, sopping and shoveling are still the best that technology can offer. And Typically, 15 to 20 percent has been the norm for retrieval of oil from the, from the water. We do have a problem with the public at large, and they do expect, and I don't think was, uh, I think it's quite reasonable that they expect we should pick up 100 percent. But with today's R&D, today's technology that we're aware of, that would appear to be about the best that we can get. Is our best good enough? This report, one of the most respected in Canada, takes a hard look at the current realities of oil spills. Uh, at this point, its author, really David Anderson. Basically, uh, technology has not come up with um, a number of very promising developments. Basically, it's still mechanical cleanup. Um, I'm not saying that we should ignore the other methods. I'm not saying we won't have a breakthrough sometime in the future, but my belief is it'll probably be incremental rather than breakthrough. Other methods of oil removal, such as dispersants and even bacteria that feed on petroleum, are still being tested and haven't yet proven themselves as effective or safe. So if technology can't clean it all up, then what will? One has to look at the conditions, the type of shoreline, the type of product, the time of year, to decide what the impact is likely to be. In an area of exposed coastline with high wave energy, a lot of current. Nature itself will do a much more efficient and quick job of removing that oil than man ever could. 
when the oil was here, it, it looked terrible. It was in, you know, in a state that we thought we would never see it like this again. But uh, we're fortunate that, you know, Mother Nature did take over and done a fairly good job of rebuilding herself. Indeed, we've come a long way in understanding the dynamic processes that take place during a spill. That knowledge has given us an uncomfortable alternative. Depending on the disposition of the sea and the weather, conditions just may warrant leaving the oil where it is. But the political and emotional climate also have to be considered, and they may never allow this. And I think that the oil companies are still in the same position where they just come in and say, well, Mother Nature is going to take good care of itself and everything is going to be just fine. We're doing our very best to clean this up. Well, I really don't believe that. Obviously, the public is directly affected. They are part of the impact and they have a right to raise their voices and voice concerns about what's taking place on something that they value or they treasure. Overall, the important lesson we've learned is that we're going to have to work with nature not against it, if we're going to deal with an oil spill effectively. There is yet another solution, perhaps the most obvious of all. Before you have a disaster, I think it's much, much more important to deal with prevention. It's costly to have a spill, apart from any uh, legal intervention that might take place by government. Therefore, it makes sense economically to create facilities and ships that uh, are less likely to cause spills. I don't want to imply that nothing has been done since the Nestuka and the Exxon Valdez, but the crucial things, which are the things that conceivably would cost money to the industry, even more than to all of us as people, are the things that, that have not been done. During the 90s, large oil corporations have invested a lot of time and money into upgrading. But one thing that's caused the public to doubt the earnestness of the companies has been their apparent reluctance to put more double-hulled tankers into service. As advanced as our engineering may be, an eggshell is still structurally stronger than an oil tanker. Obviously, double-hulling, putting another protective wall around the oil, substantially decreases the likelihood of a spill. It also increases the cost of shipping that oil. And this brings us back to the problem of budgets, what the oil companies and we as consumers are willing to pay for this prevention. Unfortunately, Canada, United States, Europe have benefited enormously, the consumers in those countries, the taxpayers of those companies have benefited enormously by using cheap ships. And we've had ships which are just barely scraping by um, carrying oil at absolutely rock bottom prices. Results of course, of this, a cheaper oil, but the result is also a higher risk of accidents. To solve some of these problems, recent amendments have been made to the Canada Shipping Act. Beginning in 1995, ships will have to file an oil spill response plan, have spill insurance, and form a contract with a spill response organization. Double hulls are now required on newly constructed ships, with a timetable set for the upgrading of existing vessels. Polluters will also pay more. Penalties will increase from six months to three years imprisonment, and fines will climb from a quarter million dollars to a full million. And that's the industry. The has province has its own agenda as well. Back. Our coastline is very fragile, and the highest priority is to eliminate entirely that vulnerability. And that means doing a number of things, requiring boats to have prevention plans, requiring the industry to put up funds uh, to develop uh, prevention strategies, to do the proper risk analysis, to move faster to double hull, uh, uh, double hulling of, uh, of vessels. So, you know, those are the top four or five priorities. And to get all of the governments working cooperatively uh, and to maintain the momentum that we've developed over the past two years in that regard. North Vicontis, uh, my radar still shows several small fishing vessels to the south and west of you. Please continue to keep a good lookout. Better vigilance is definitely paying off. Improved Coast Guard radar facilities continue to carefully monitor the port of Vancouver, the Straits, and the west coast of BC. They closely watch the flow of vessels as they travel in and out of Canadian waters. It's a regimen that can cite a lot of potential problems 
long before they're a threat. But while the government is on watch, who's watching the government? But isn't it true over like the past five years, the average size of a tanker calling on the port of Vancouver basically doubled from 40 to 80,000 deadweight tons? To this end, British Columbia has set up a citizens' advisory committee, which works with other public concerns, keeping tabs on the progress of prevention and response. Some feel this group is a step in the right direction, but that the concept still needs improving. You need to have somebody outside the loop looking in, because people inside the loop, I mean, there's relationships developed, there's all, there's all kinds of pressures. And you need to have somebody whose responsibility it is to be a royal pain in the ass and say, how come this inspection was delayed? Sometimes there's good answers, sometimes there's not. No matter how well prepared various agencies are, the first people to deal with this bill will usually be those who have to live with it. Clearly, if we're going to be um, required to respond to spills anywhere on the BC coast, then working with local communities is going to be a big issue. Across the Strait of Juan de Fuca, on the northwest tip of the United States, lies the native community of Nia Bay. Here, the strait opens up into one of the busiest shipping channels in the world. Among other things, People here would like to see large tugs stationed closer to their end of the strait, should steerage or engines fail on threatening vessels. In the meantime, the Macaw tribe is organizing an environmental response team. Today, volunteers are drilling themselves in boom deployment. Here, dedication is strong, but funding is low. In the meantime, they work with what they have. Five hundred feet of boom. They need over five thousand feet, but even that will only be effective if seas are relatively calm, and calm seas aren't likely to be what brings oil to these shores. Further east, in more populated regions, there is less of a problem with preparedness. Response vessels from Clean Sound and Burrard Clean are much closer. In Washington State's San Juan Islands in the community of Friday Harbor, funding has been less difficult. Like Nia Bay, Friday Harbor and its neighboring island communities are directly in the path of U.S. and Canadian tanker traffic. At the local fire hall, one of the Pacific Northwest's most effective citizens' response groups is holding another session. And finally, when you complete this course, you will get a certificate and be registered as a person who could be called upon as a resource in the event that there's an oil spill. The meeting has been arranged by this as woman, well Julie Knight. Calling. The volunteers that we have here are very high quality. They are doing it because they care. We have young people, we have a lot of women and a lot of men and people that would be classified as conservative and liberal and they are all working together in the same organization, caring about the same thing, and finding out that really they're not as polarized as, as they might think, that they really have a lot of things in common. Julie Knight heads the Islands Oil Spill Association, known as IOSA. To train IOSA's 300 volunteers, Julie depends on various resources, including the government, commercial contractors, and a number of other agencies. Such connections are critical when effectiveness is the ultimate issue. You have to be part of the total spill response network. It takes time to become established and integrated into the system, but that is one of the most important things for being effective and actually being involved and getting to do your job. IOSA is funded by memberships and the support of local businesses and corporations, including the oil industry. This gives them the capacity to assess some 30 spills a year and take part in cleanup or wildlife rescue in three or four of those. Though always short of staff and facilities, IOSA is doing its job well, and it's doing it as part of the community, not as an outside force. We didn't just as a community sit around and complain that nobody was doing anything to take care of us. We just went ahead and planned something and got the support that we needed and, and accomplished the goal. We have this course this evening. It should take about three hours. There's, uh, More BC communities are doing the same, like this group in Port Hardy. I think we can start. 
They're training to be paid volunteers of an oil spill workforce. Spearheaded by the BC Ministry of Environment, several agencies are pooling efforts to provide these teams with command posts, communications, protective clothing, and cleanup tools. And if people come to the beaches, incidentally, and they haven't been through the training, we'll provide the training on site. We're not attempting to exclude anybody from it, but we, we don't want people on the beach who haven't been trained and certified and are kept safe. A new desire for cooperation, efficiency and safety has come from some old difficult lessons. Lessons that have given the government, industry and the public at large a broader understanding of the predicaments and the politics of oil spills. I think it's wonderful that as many people as are working to, to try and make it the cleanup end as efficient as possible, but really as, as everybody who says it looks into it, you've got to try to prevent them. And that may be much more possible because of some innovative work at the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. In this darkened room at BC's Institute of Ocean Sciences, mapping experts are computerizing the detailed coastal charts of Canada and other parts of the world. From here, these digital diagrams will become part of an electronic charting system, which is being hailed as the most important navigational tool since radar. Electronic charting provides pilots with every element they need to ensure a safe journey. They can access layers of visual information, such as tides, depth, and shoreline details, and in relation to these, see the position of their ship and other vessels in real time. Over 90%, in fact, of the accidents and incidents at sea have been caused by human error. And this is the only technology that we've seen that uh, addresses that issue. It makes operations for the mariner more effective and allows um, better decision making right on the bridge. Through a cooperative enterprise with private industry, DFO hopes to eventually see these electronic devices installed as a standard on ships of all sizes, especially those carrying hazardous cargo. It uh, certainly is less expensive than cleaning up. It's much easier on the environment than having to deal with a spill. And it's most sensible, just prevent them, keep the ship off the rocks in the first place. In the meantime, we can't just concentrate our concerns on giant tankers. A lot of cumulative damage can be done by a host of other vessels, such as recreational craft, fish processors, pleasure ships, and poorly maintained freighters. There's also impact from on and offshore commercial facilities which handles sizable volumes of petroleum product. Better laws and tighter inspections are keeping the larger threats at bay. For the smaller craft, better education programs and proper oil disposal stations, like this one, are helping keep waters clear. Our society has chosen petroleum products as its mainstay. No matter how many safeguards, that choice carries the threat of blackened waters, along with the questions, answers, and controversies that surround this complicated issue. With each question answered, there are more below the surface, and there will be new ones tomorrow. Our job is to continue to learn, to question, to cooperate, and to celebrate what we have by protecting it.